so with that said, I'd actually like to kick off today's session by sharing a little bit about the Miro ecosystem for those of you who might be a little less familiar. So today is all about how you can build apps and integrations on top of Miro's developer platform, and more specifically, uh, apps and integrations that are likely to be adopted by our uh, 60 million plus users on Miro who come from various different backgrounds, uh, including large companies and enterprises who use Miro for product development and you know everyday workflows. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, jump into that. <laughs> you can ignore the, uh, the doorbell ringing in the background. So uh, the vast majority of the apps integrations that are accessible through Miro's public marketplace, um, they are home to a collection of yeah, hundreds of trusted apps and integrations to help Miro users streamline the workflows and connect their favorite tools. So publishing on the marketplace allows you to distribute your app or integration to that potential audience of 60 million plus users who use third-party solutions. And of course, there's even more opportunities should you wish to monetize your apps or integrations. So uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, so we offer some unique uh, opportunities um, when you publish on our marketplace. And developers are eligible for benefits such as one-to-one -one consultations, uh, a complimentary Miro business plan with five seats, uh, app promotion, and, and a lot more. And um, we'll share some links in, in the chat with um, a bit more of a direct kind of uh, overview of some of these developer benefits. So um, now before we jump in, just a quick note about your hosts today. Uh, so for those of you who are new to our developer community, my name is Will Bishop, and I'm one of our developer advocates here at Miro. I'm really passionate about all things web development and uh, you know product, but especially when it comes to Miro apps, uh, which is why I'm really excited to dive into more details around our ecosystem today and talk about how you can build apps of your own. Um, so I'm going to kick it over to Horia uh, to introduce himself as well. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Will. Hi, everybody. My name is Horia Peruzio. I'm a developer advocate at Miro. And I'm very passionate about emerging technologies, so things like AI, open source, and um, I love helping developers with code samples or app examples. Uh, so you'll see me um, contribute contributing a lot on GitHub. So I love helping out the community and love seeing cool applications and integrations built. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. Awesome. Thanks, Horia. And now let's go ahead and give you a preview of exactly what we're going to cover today. So um, we are going to start by quickly telling you a bit about the Miro developer platform. And uh, we'll dive into some capabilities and common Miro personas. Uh, then we'll dive into some of the finer details around building secure apps. Uh, we'll raise some important points around marketplace app requirements. Uh, we'll walk you through some best practices. And then uh, we're going to talk about uh, what Miro admins look for when evaluating app approval requests to be able to bring your app to their entire organization. Um, and lastly, we're going to set a bit of time aside for a Q&A uh, at the end. Um, and that actually brings me to another important point that I'd like to call out, which is uh, feel free to post your questions as they come up in the chat or the Q&A, and we'll try to answer them throughout. Um, but uh, if we don't get to them during, we'll make sure to save time at the end to cover um, everything that's popped up. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Horia to talk a bit about uh, personas and app frameworks. Great. Thanks, Will. So yeah, let's learn a little bit more about our users and who we're actually building our apps from. So let's talk about who actually works on Miro. So while there's a lot of different users on Miro, we try to primarily focus on six, five to six different personas. So we usually focus on product managers, developers, designers, UX researchers, consultants, and agile coaches. And as you can already see in the chat, uh, Miro is actually heavily used in education, so in the university setting. So there's a lot of actually students that work with Miro to better collaborate on coursework. Um, so, you know, these are a lot of the different personas. And when we think about personas, uh, we also like to think about some of the major use cases that um, users like to uh, use Miro for. So one of the major use cases is agile. So planning things, um, things using things such as Miro or sorry, uh, Jira, um, to plan your sprints. Um, a lot of people like to actually use mapping and diagramming tools on Miro. So we actually have a draw.io integration that we'll show very soon. We also see a lot of data visualizations with things such as Looker or other types of dashboards. 
And last but not least, of course, people love to do workshops in Miro. Um, so it's great for that async collaboration and being able to brainstorm uh, with your coworkers or, or uh, fellow students and things like that. So these are just some of the main use cases. So now we want to show a couple of the apps that we actually have in our Miro marketplace and that are actually um, kind of catered to some of these uh, different use cases. So for example, we have draw.io here, and we can go ahead and click on that graph to the right. Um, and if you click on that pencil icon, we can actually see the integration. So here it pops up our draw.io interface. We can change something. So we can say like, instead of date created, maybe you can do like date time or something and then click save and close. And that should um, go ahead and update our graph there. And of course now that's actually a uh, object on the mirror board. So we can select it, move it around, change it and do all the you know fun stuff we like to do on mirror, like comment and, and uh, write up. So that's a cool diagramming app example. Next, we'll show an agile example. So a lot of um, people use Sparksheet to keep track of projects. So things such as like project management, and I'm not going to go too deep into this app example because we'll show it later on in the uh, webinar. So just keep that uh, in mind. Um, and now let's actually transition to the Mirror Developer Platform. So we're, we're going to talk a little bit about the main components of the developer platform. First, we have the Web SDK, which we'll cover in a lot more detail uh, coming up. Next, we have the REST API, and that's kind of very familiar to developers. These are endpoints that developers can use to be able to do backend related work. Maybe it's gathering um, analytics, such as how many users your mirror boards have. Maybe you want to um, change permissions or automate creations of boards. So you can do that all via our REST API. And last but not least, we have our live embed feature. And I'm really excited to uh, show you this one soon, and you'll see that uh, very, very quickly. Um, but that's basically being able to embed Miro and that Miro board into another tool. Um, so it's a very, very fun, fun way to uh, take that, take Miro somewhere else. Um, the main thing I want you to understand about the Web SDK is that these are this is the framework that we use to build apps directly on a mirror board. So usually we'll want somebody that's opening the board. We want some sort of collaboration. And these, this framework, the Web SDK, allows you to have collaborative experiences, such as creating an app which will um, take users and put them in different breakout rooms. And that's something we uh, have on GitHub. And then um, now let's talk about what does an SDK app actually look like? So um, the SDK apps live in the left sidebar. Um, there you should see a plus icon that will say more apps. And there you can search for our apps. You can also search within the marketplace to add it into your uh, Miro app. And uh, what you can see there is that left uh, panel. And you, know, you can have some custom UI there. And then, for example, this is a basic calendar app. Um, this is actually on GitHub as well, um, where you're able to select the month and the year. And then once you click on Insert Calendar, you're going to use the uh, Miro SDK and APIs to create the shapes on the Miro board to actually uh, resemble a calendar. So it's a great way to plan, uh, plan different things on Miro. So now this is a, I want to talk a little bit more about the Miro web SDK, and we're going to go directly into our docs uh, to see it live. So here we've created an embed here, and here are our docs, and we're going to go into just one of our favorite um, things to do in Miro, which is creating a sticky note. So in our docs, we have these code examples. And if you click on try it, it will actually use live embed. So this is uh, that third part of our platform, which I mentioned, which is embedding a Miro board within these uh, this other tool, which in this case is our documentation. So let's go ahead and change that content on the sticky note. Just say something like, hi, from uh, the webinar. So here, what's really great is that you can go ahead and type in your code here and run it without needing a coding environment. You can all do it within the docs. Uh, so you can see that um, sticky note pop up and that's actually populated on a, on a mirror board. So you're able to try out our SDK methods and do it live from the docs. And this is actually how I debug a lot of my issues. Um, or if I'm building an app, I'll literally just go right into the docs like read the read the uh, parameters and then just try it out right there and just 
uh, run the code. So highly encourage you all to try it out. Next, we're going to do a quick uh, REST API demo. So again, this is all within our docs. So if you go into our API reference, the docs a little bit look a little bit different. And of course, they have our API endpoints. And the first thing that you notice before you use an API request, you're going to need to authorize, and you'll need an access token. So what we've done is we've created this get access token button. And what you do here is select a team, and then you uh, add it. So that will actually generate an access token on the fly. And now you can go ahead and create a board, or you can test out your APIs right within the docs. So you can click on Try It, and then that will give you that response. We got a 201, so that means it worked. Um, and you can see the actual uh, API response that you would receive if you're coding um, a backend application. So again, great way to test things out right within the docs without having to set up a coding environment. Um, so we try to make it as easy for you as, as possible to get started with our APIs. Um, and with that, I'll pass it to Will to talk about building secure apps. Awesome. Thanks, Horia. So um, it's no surprise that building apps and integrations that uh, instill confidence in enterprise organizations is got to be a top priority if that's the audience you're trying to get adoption from. Um, and to lead to that adoption means, yeah, again, just putting security and data integrity first in your app development. And there's a lot of things to think about, but let's break it down just a little bit here. Um, so the most surefire way to build transparency with uh, would-be enterprise adopters of your app is to make sure that you're taking into account the same things that will be top of mind for organizations and their admins uh, with any SaaS software that they use. And oftentimes, these are going to be the people approving or rejecting app installation requests on behalf of an entire account. So if you want your Miro app to be you know, heavily adopted by these enterprises, you have to make sure you're meeting their you know, stringent requirements. Um, so to name a few, this includes app security, so things like authorization, how you're managing credentials, PII, and more. Uh, this includes you know, data storage. So uh, similarly, are you storing end user data? Uh, if so, how and where? Um, is this data leaving Miro in any way? Uh, you also want to think about the information you're, you're sharing about your app publicly. So you know, are you clearly surfacing important details about the functionality and what the app does and which Miro scopes it uses and why? Um, and then, of course, developer information. So who are you? Um, is there a way to see who you are as a developer or the organization who created the app? Do you have a publicly accessible, incredible you know, profile? Um, and to make this even more credible, are there certifications or third-party stamps of approval that you could highlight uh, as well? So these are all things we want to think of and have top of mind. So with this in mind, let's actually take a closer look at you know, building secure apps, starting with authorization. So uh, it's no surprise that OAuth is the industry standard uh, for you know, uh, authorizing uh, APIs. And uh, you know, Miro uses this as well. So I want to take a moment to highlight the importance of using uh, also just the OAuth scopes that you need uh, when you're actually creating an integration. And I'm going to just quickly uh, change from the presentation here and go to uh, my app settings. So I'm going to go to developers.miro.com. And let's pretend that I'm just creating a brand new integration from scratch. Uh, so right here, I'm in my kind of developer hub homepage. And let's say I want to create a new app for a REST API integration. I'm going to use OAuth to authorize you know, the access. Um, but the thing that I want to point out is in relation to scopes. So I'm just going to create a, a quick kind of um, test app here. And if you're familiar with OAuth, you know we've got a client ID and a client secret. Um, but the part I want to talk about now is in relation to permissions. So uh, both our REST API and Web SDK implement user access control through these scopes, which are also a kind of default part of OAuth. And if your app's going to do you know, something where you're just creating sticky notes or you're reading sticky notes or board information from someone's account, then really all you need is this boards read and boards write scope. Um, so what you don't want to do is just select every possible scope, even if you're just going to use these first two, um, especially when large organizations and admins are looking at what kind of app they're going to approve. Um, if they see that you've selected every possible scope and you have potential access to you know, way more information for the end user than you actually need. Um, that's kind of a red flag. So you want to make sure as a best practice that when you're implementing OAuth, you're only using the minimum viable scopes. Um, it seems kind of obvious, but 
Um, it's, of course, a very big part of enterprise adoption for Miro apps. So let's keep moving along and talk a little bit more about OAuth. And I want to start with just a quick kind of example of um, Smartsheet, who implements OAuth for their uh, integration between Miro and Smartsheet. And it's just a great example of what this could look like practically. So let me make this a little bit bigger. And you can see here, we've got this login with Smartsheet button from the Miro Web SDK. And this initiates the OAuth flow where the end user has to allow access between uh, Smartsheet and Miro. And then once this is done, we can go back to Miro and right from our Miro app, we can actually import data from Smartsheet. So you can see here, we're actually in like a, a test sheet with um, a few different rows of information. And we're gonna import these as Miro cards. And it's gonna be a, a direct two-way sync between the information on this Miro card and the information in Smartsheet. And actually to make things even easier with this kind of integration, we can update content in Miro uh, on our, our app card here. And these changes are going to be immediately reflected in Smartsheet. So if we were to go back to Smartsheet, you'll see in just a second where it highlights the, the row in blue, the update we made in Miro is now reflected in Smartsheet. And this would not be possible, of course, without that secure OAuth authorization, allowing end users to essentially you know, confirm that they understand you're going to use uh, Smartsheet and Miro in combination uh, for their accounts. So just an example of both uh, OAuth implementation as well as a two-way sync integration between Miro and a third party, which is a really big use case for enterprises who use Miro for um, you know, planning all sorts of different uh, work. Now, I wanna take a moment to kind of dive into some of the finer details of our security guidelines for getting an app published on the Miro marketplace. So uh, we've touched a lot on you know, some of the important aspects of building secure apps with enterprise users in mind, but what else does Miro uh, actually expect when reviewing apps and integrations? So this brings us to our security guidelines, which, you know, as I mentioned, are going to require that you're careful about what you're storing. Um, and first off, you know, ask yourself if you really need to store things like credentials or other sensitive kinds of uh, artifacts. Um, beyond this, you know, there's more obvious things like, you know, not hard coding API keys or access tokens, uh, encrypting any sensitive details if you must store them. Uh, you know, not caching sensitive data. Um, but there's two other things I'd like to point out as well. Um, so when it comes to preparing your app from uh, moving from development to production, you really want to make sure you're taking the time to review any artifacts from your developer environment that shouldn't be exposed in production. So things like, you know, logging development notes, um, you know, for example, it may seem obvious, but don't forget to clear those console logs, et cetera. You know, that could be exposed in the browser console uh, if left unkept, and that would not meet, you know, Miro uh, security guidelines. Uh, next, I just want to take a moment to talk about vulnerabilities. So, you know, Miro's security team is going to review apps that are free of any medium, high, or critical vulnerabilities. Um, so if you're familiar with OWASP, um, they're like an open source foundation that sets many of the industry standards for uh, projects and their dependencies. And this is what Miro will often use to, to check this as well. So they actually have a free dependency check that you can use straight from the command line even to check your app for integration during development so that you're not surprised <clears throat> when it comes to actually publishing your app on our marketplace. So um, with that in mind, we've covered a lot of the important aspects of security here, but um, where can you actually see like a detailed list of what Miro and you know, subsequently the enterprises who might adopt your app um, need to know are addressed? Well, that's also in our developer documentation. So if you go to developers.miro.com and under the Miro Marketplace section, you can find all of our detailed requirements for data storage, network configuration, uh, domain control, and the list goes on. So this is kind of your, your one-stop shop for uh, preparing an app for, you know, um, for your users. All right, and now I'm going to go ahead and kick it back over to Horia to talk a bit about Marketplace app requirements. Great. Thanks, Will. So now that we've um, talked a little bit about building secure apps, now let's talk a little bit about the Miro Marketplace. So the main thing you need to know when going to the Miro Marketplace is that all of these apps which are listed on our Marketplace have already passed pretty intensive security, uh, UX, and design reviews. So they should meet a pretty high level of standards in terms of security um, in UX and design. Um, 
So you can kind of be assured that whatever you're installing from our marketplace um, is going to be secure and going to have a pretty good user experience. So now let's talk a little bit about the app requirements. So these are the things you need to really take into consideration in order to uh, pass our uh, marketplace uh, test. So we have security, uh, data privacy, design, and support. And we're going to talk a little bit more about each of these in a little bit more detail. So here uh, on developers.mirror.com, you can find our listing guidelines. So uh, we're going to also show you an example. But basically, you will need to think about your logo, your app visuals to be able to tell users what your app does, of course, your app description. And then what's also really key is the resource resources and links. So maybe your developer page, and then also ensuring that you've tagged your app in the correct category so that when users are looking for maybe productivity apps or diagramming apps, um, it's going to be able to show up there. Um, so that's a little bit more about um, the guidelines. And now we'll show you an example. So this is Super Search. This is one of our um, apps in the marketplace. And you can see it does a great job of showing what the functionality of the app does. So you can search and replace. Um, you can do different things with that app. And it has a, yeah, it has a great UI and, and kind of video component to kind of show you within a few seconds, what does the app do? So that's really great. You can see they have relevant links there. You can see on the right-hand side about the developer, um, if you click on that link, you know, you can see other apps they've published. Um, so you can see that, you know, they have not only Super Search, they have Easy Translator, Video Clipper. So some of the other things, they have the contact button. And of course, they have the categories um, that the app is, is uh, sorted into. So they've done a great job at um, basically, um, yeah, creating a great uh, app listing. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Will to talk a little bit more about best practices. Yeah, thanks a lot, Horia. So uh, just kind of going off of where, where he just left off, I uh, just want to really emphasize the importance of setting up your app listing for success. Uh, you really need to think of it as a presentation to would-be enterprises or admins who are going to really um, yeah, think twice about uh, what your app does, how it'll impact uh, their organization's use of Miro, um, and all these kinds of things. So, you know, making sure that you have your developer profile filled out, you know, really accurately um, highlight anything that um, could be important, such as certifications or, you know, SOC compliance, like anything that is going to add that kind of trustworthiness and, you know, reputation to both you as a partner or a developer, as well as the app you've built. Um, and again, similar to what Horio was saying, making sure that you have links for support and resources, that your app's using those you know, minimum viable scopes. These are, again, things that might seem obvious, but these are going to be the first things that uh, you know, admins and, and large organizations are thinking about when they consider adopting your app or not. And uh, like we already touched on, having great visuals as well, especially if you can find a way to um, use the visuals to demonstrate what the app actually does so that in you know, just one to two seconds, it's very clear what the functionality is and how it would be used. Uh, beyond this, we want to also emphasize that the look and feel of your app has a really big impact on adoption as well, not just you know in terms of approval by an enterprise, but actually users who are using your app for the first time. So we have a, a what we call a Miro Tone UI kit, which is essentially like a, a CSS library that you can use to easily get the look and feel of Miro uh, in your web SDK app so that users who are interacting with the Miro board and then open your app, and are going between these different mediums, you know, they it's kind of a seamless experience where they feel like they're in Miro the whole time. And, and they are, um, but it's just kind of taking that extra step. Uh, also, you know, really important to think about too is when a user opens your app for the first time, are they going to know what to do? Um, you know, you don't want to lose a user who opens your app once, it isn't clear to them how to use it or what the value is, and then they close it and never open it again. So we recommend things like tool tips, you know, on hover, maybe a quick explanation of what a button does. Or if you do some kind of you know guided demo the first time the app opens, these are really easy ways to ensure that uh, adoption is you know top of mind. And then the last thing I want to talk about here is what do you do once your app is published and you want to keep iterating on it? So we have uh, what we call the app metrics dashboard, and this is a really great tool to have in your toolkit as a partner or a developer when you're thinking about you know is your app being successfully adopted? Maybe are there things you want to tweak? 
Um, what, are, what are the numbers you can look at to help make these decisions? So we have a whole dashboard that you can use to inform uh, yeah, these decisions. So let's take a quick look at an example. So this is the app metrics dashboard for uh, the Wordle app that's on our marketplace, uh, which is actually built by someone here at Miro, but um, it's a really good example of how you can get kind of a snapshot of understanding the installations, uh, active users, uh, et cetera, of your app um, over time. So we can see here, you got a quick snapshot of the total number, uh, number of installations of your app, uh, how many organizations are using it, um, you know, the number of unique users, and then you can get kind of a macro view of what's happening between a certain date range, or, you know, perhaps a more micro view of, um, you know, what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is a really great way to, yeah, make data-driven decisions uh, about your app and maybe what you want to do next. Or, you know, if you see a drop-off one month, maybe you've got a critical bug that you're not aware of, and this is a great place to catch things like that. So uh, with that, I'm going to kick it back over to Horia to talk a bit more about what admins are going to be looking for when approving or denying Miro apps. Great. Thank you, Will. So yeah, let's talk a little bit more about admin approval and why does it ma matter. So in order for your app to reach an even wider audience, you're likely going to have to be able to pass some sort of admin approval. And that's the reason is, is that many of our enterprise uh, customers usually have some sort of company admin, which is actually approving or denying apps. So you're going to have to pass this test to be able to act for their company or their users to actually install and use the app. Um, and essentially, we're going to look at some of the main things that an app uh, admin or the company admin is going to look for. So um, here is the flow for end users. So let's say I want to use Asana cards. So actually I use Asana a lot. So I think this would be really useful. And what I'll do is I'll go into my app section on the left sidebar. I'll search for Asana. I'll click on it. And then if there's a company admin, which needs to approve, you'll be able to see the screen. If there's no company admin, you'll be able to just click allow and, and start uh, and actually authorize the app. But this is that um, requires admin approval screen. And then you'll have to actually give an installation request and then just hit uh, submit approval. And then for the app, uh, for the company admin, this is what they're going to see on their end. So in their account, if they click on apps, um, they'll be able to have a tab that says app requests. And in there, they'll see all the requests that are coming in and they'll see the app name. Um, more details such as like which team it's installed on, um, when is it created, how many requests. So maybe there's multiple users that are requesting the same app. And then, of course, they can click on read more, and that will likely take them to the developer profile and um, actually see you know what scopes is this app requesting and more things like that. And of course, they'll have the approve or deny button there. And once they approve it, you're going to be able to use it. So based on user research, we know that there's three main things that admins look for in app approvals. And we this should come at no surprise. We've already talked about these. Um, but the main three things that we know admins look for are data protection. So where are uh, certain things like PII stored? Security. So did it pass all of the security, um, security measures? And of course, if you have extra security certifications, that's going to be a huge bonus, and that'll likely help a lot in terms of getting that app approval. And last but not least, trust and tra transparency. So having a developer website, which shows off maybe some of the other integrations or apps that you've built, is there a way to support uh, contact support, uh, things like that. These are all going to go a long way in enabling uh, these company admins to approve your app. And now I'll pass it over to Will to wrap us up. Yeah, thanks a lot, Horia. So um, as he was just saying, there's a lot of things that admins consider when approving a Miro app for integration. Um, if you guys have any questions about anything we've covered uh, today, whether it be related to building an app or um, what we focused on today, which was really like making sure you build an app that's actually ready for enterprises, um, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, but if we don't get any questions, you know, we can also um, share some resources with you as well. So um, yeah, a great question from uh, Tashiki. Is it possible to monetize with Miro apps? 
Yes, so it is possible to monetize with Miro apps. Um, we don't have a fully native solution supported yet within the platform itself, though it's something we're working on. Um, but we do uh, really, um, yeah, like we definitely uh, encourage you to use like a paywall or something like that on your app to start monetizing before we even offer a native solution. Um, though it shouldn't be too long, uh, we have a really great example of how you can monetize your uh, apps using uh, Stripe. So if you go to our developer documentation and you go to our web SDK uh, tutorials, you'll find this uh, guide called uh, monetizing your apps with Miro and Stripe. And it walks you through how to create a paywall, um, some suggested UI, and uh, basically an example of how you could have like a feature uh, flag for paid users or non-paid users. And this is a really popular approach for people um, who've monetized Miro apps on our marketplace, such as Super Search or Easy Translator. Um, those are just a few examples of apps that have a, this kind of paywall. A uh, question from Juno. Can I get a consultation session as a starter? We have enterprise plan. Yeah, so if you are just starting, starting out with your Miro app development, uh, basically if you create an app in uh, Miro under the developer platform, you're entitled to that first developer benefit which is a one-on-one -on -one consultation. So um, once you are eligible, you'll see it because it's gonna pop up in your developer hub. And you'll see this little benefits section here. Uh, it's currently in beta, but basically once it's unlocked, you'll be able to click book now and you can talk with someone from the Miro developer platform to be able to yeah, ask any questions you have, whether it's technical or you know, about more business oriented questions like monetization, uh, et cetera. Uh, we've got a question from Sajad. If we make an integration with Miro to embed it in our platform, is there a way to get the content of the design as text using API? Hmm, good question. So there is definitely a way to read content from a Miro board. Um, so that is possible with both our web SDK and our REST API. Um, just as a quick example here, I can kind of show you if we go to like um, our uh, get boards API, um, this is gonna return information such as uh, like the board ID. And then from there, you can use that board ID to get a specific board or items on a board. And so here, if you use like the get items on a board, you could get text, you could get sticky notes, you could get shapes, all that kind of stuff. So uh, whatever you have on a mural board is accessible through both the API and web SDK. Uh, let's see here. Question from Marcel. Um, in the past, had issues with the availability of some of the functionality in the REST API, which were not available in the web SDK. Is there any guidance on how to approach this problem? Yeah, really good question, Marcel. Um, so over the last year, we've tried as much as possible to close the gap of parity between the REST API and the web SDK. And I would say we're at just about like maybe 97% or so. There are a few things left um, here and there to be able to use the web SDK in the same manner as the REST API. Um, but for the most part, um, you can find a detailed list of um, like what's available in each uh, uh, framework, um, both in the documentation, but then we also have a migration guide. And even though the migration guide is um, a bit more about migrating from V1 to V2, it also serves as a really good overview of what's available in the web SDK versus the REST API. So you know, uh, I would also recommend checking out the uh, comparison guides that we have here in our migration resources, because it's just a really good aggregated view of the functionalities in the Web SDK and the REST API. Um, then beyond that, you know, using the search here, you can also search the reference versus the guides, which is also a handy way to look for things between the Web SDK and the REST API. Um, and then lastly, if you're still wondering if something's available, then, you know, feel free to reach out to us directly. Uh, perhaps on our Discord, or um, shoot us a message, and we can certainly help you figure out, you know, what's possible or what we recommend. Uh, another question from Sajad. This is related to, yeah, basically like reading content from a board. Is there a way to export it as an image using the REST API? That is a very good question, and actually, it's it's a top feature request. I would say it's not supported at the moment, but it is something that's on our radar. Uh, we would love to be able to do something similar to like, yeah, if you're in the UI, being able to copy something as an image, um, definitely on our radar, but not supported at the moment. Uh, 
Uh, let's see. We've got one question in the Q and A from Nir. If I want to have a Miro board as part of a web app, which is deployed outside Miro, what's the best approach? Um, I'm going to put you on the spot here, Horia. <laughs> Do you have any uh, any guidance on this one? Yeah, I think um, I think you can go with the live embed there. Yep. I was going to say the same thing. Uh, the live embed is probably the easiest way to just directly embed a, a Miro board. So it's similar to what uh, Horia showed, you know, earlier, this kind of uh, like essentially just you got the Miro board right on, on your page. You could do something similar to this um, with uh, any kind of basic web page or, or web app. Yeah, we do have those tutorials and documentations on how to get started implementing that live embed. Um, in our docs. Yeah. Oh, uh, we've got a question from Renee. Is there a way to clear a board using the REST API? And I don't mean by deleting each board item one by one. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question, Renee. Um, so there's not a single method to clear a mirror board, but it is another great suggestion. Um, one thing we do have, however, is um, a bulk operations endpoint for our REST API which I believe also has the, um, the delete functionality in there as well. Um, so I'd recommend checking this out to see if maybe this um, could help you. Although I'm just realizing that um, this one's still an experimental and I'm not sure if we've added the delete capability to it yet. I'll have to double check on that one for you, but um, ideally uh, we'll soon offer a way to bulk delete items as well. So it's, it's a great question, uh, another good feature request. Um, something we have some traction on, but uh, not quite yet. Nice. Uh, we've got a question from Aaron. Is there a limit to what extent we can use the REST API to create boards using a BPMN tool? Um, BPMN tool, just jogging my mind real quick. Is that like some kind of business intelligence tool? Um, trying to, I'm sure this is something obvious, but um generally okay some kind of automation yeah so um not not really you can create as many boards as you want via api um the thing to keep in mind is the limitation of your account so you know if you're on like a free or starter plan there's going to be limitations on the number of boards you can have like per team um but then beyond that you want to keep an eye on rate limits as well so um uh, you know overall our rate limits i would say are pretty generous um you should be able to create um, a significant number of items or boards um, through the API. And it's a very popular use case to use the API to manage boards. So um, I think you would find the create boards endpoint um, quite useful for that. And yeah, no major limitations in, in a nutshell, other than the limitations of like your Miro plan. Yeah, lots of great questions here. And um, yeah, similar to what I was saying before, uh, although this webinar focused a lot on kind of preparing an app or an integration for um, a larger audience, um, we also have done webinars in the past that are a bit more technical in terms of having, um, you know, how to create your first web SDK app or how to create your first integration. Um, and we'll do more of those in the future too. So make sure to, you know, stay tuned to all of our different channels here, like our YouTube channel, uh, join our Discord. And then, you know, if you're actually looking for inspiration to build your first app, then I highly recommend checking out our integration wish list. So this is a list generated by our community of end users for integrations that they wish they had in Miro that are just you know waiting for partners and developers like you all to actually build them. So a great place to get inspiration. And uh, Aaron, to get back to your question, yes, there is a way. Um, so I think what uh, you're talking about is basically like if you were to create an app or an integration, that wanted to do this on behalf of other Miro users, like under their own account. And that is definitely possible. You just have to implement the OAuth 2.0 flow. And once those users authorize your app, you're going to get an access token that you can use to create boards under their account specifically. So it's definitely possible. Awesome. And then yeah. Yeah. Just one last thing. Um, I think Zunu asked, is it possible to find out which board someone is in by REST API? And yes, it is. Um, there's, I, I showed, uh, you can use the get boards uh, API and I can just 
uh, pass it in there, and then there's an owner um, parameter that you could use and just use that uh, user ID, and then you'll get all the boards for that specific user. Yeah, great point, Maria. Awesome. I think. Oh, and then also, <laughs> sorry, like the, yeah. Renee also mentioned um, a feature checking if two board items overlap or not. We do have the find mm. empty space method. Um, yes. Yeah, another to... great, another great question. Um, let me just quickly show where you can find this. So, Renee, this is not with the REST API, but this is with the Web SDK, um, and we have a method called find empty space which is essentially going to let you know where on the board items like aren't overlapping. And you can actually also set uh, additional parameters um, that al allow you to create an offset. So how much space do you want between items, essentially? Um, so I think this would be a very handy method uh, to use. And actually, I can try to show an example right now. Um, so this is probably not a great example because this board is pretty much empty. But uh, if we run something like this, um, yeah, well, this is not a good example, but I do recommend checking out this method because if you had a, a ton of items on a board and you want to set, uh, yeah, a particular like offset optionally, um, it's a great way to identify where things aren't overlapping. Um, but you're using the REST API, so any plans implemented there. Um, we don't have any plans at the moment, but it is a really good feature request, um, and that kind of brings me to. Uh, one last point for, for everyone here is if you have an idea that uh, you'd love to see, uh, first check to see if it's already been suggested and maybe you could upvote it. Um, this is a great way for us to take a look at the demand for certain things. Um, you can see that on our public facing roadmap here. So if you want to add a plus one to something that's there, you can do that. But also you can submit a new idea and this will go to a kind of a, a backlog that we can check out from you know developers and partners to, to understand the demand. But uh, it's a really good suggestion, Renee, something we're happy to pass along too, because yeah, I can definitely appreciate if you're working with the REST API, wanting to be able to do a similar kind of thing. Awesome. Well, uh, lots of great questions from you all. Really appreciate the, uh, yeah, hanging out with us today and learning a bit more about building enterprise-ready Miro apps. Um, and with that, we're going to, um, yeah, we're going to, phase out here and um, hopefully we'll see you in our next webinar. Um, and yeah, if you have questions or, you know, want to keep going, definitely uh, join our Discord server where you can talk to us uh, directly and um, yeah, get inspiration, get help, all that kind of stuff. Try.